Hello, um, and thank you so much, Alicia. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Erica Sussman, and I am the founder and executive director of the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Hi, this is Sarah Wee. I'm joining as well from CSAJ. Um, I'm our director of research and programs. I'm so thrilled to be be here with you all. And yes, thanks again to you, Alicia, for, for helping us out today. Great. Um, so I wanted to um, start off by giving folks a general understanding of um, the um, perspective that the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice brings to um, this particular project and to talk a little bit about the origins of it and the evolution of our thinking and the evolution of our work and how it is that we've gotten to the place that we are right now. Um, so let me do a little bit of that and also give you all um, a heads up that there are spots throughout today's webinar where, where we will be asking you some questions in hopes that you'll share your incredibly rich expertise with us. Um, I perused the um, registration list, the list of participants, and um, there are folks from all over doing really critical advocacy work. So we are thrilled to have you all with us today and um, very hopeful that you'll contribute your insights along the way. So um, CSAJ is a national organization that has been in existence for over 10 years now. Um, we began a long time ago um, as a um, technical assistance provider that was focused specifically on meeting the civil legal needs of domestic and sexual violence survivors. Um, we've worked with OBW grantees um, for over a decade in really um, helping to lift up and enhance the legal and non-legal advocacy work that folks are doing um, in partnership with survivors across the country. And so um, at our inception, um, the idea was that we were observing sort of a um, increased um, compartmentalization and professionalization of advocacy um, cropping up in different spaces um, throughout the country. And so CSAJ was founded in an effort to um, link survivor-centered advocacy practice, um, or rather survivor-centered advocacy theory with practice um, to encourage and um, think with lawyers and advocates around the country about what survivor-centered advocacy really looks like um, as we do our work. And so that was the sort of broad um, inception of our work. And it will come as no surprise to many of you that um, once you center the self-defined needs and priorities of survivors and their communities, you um, find that economic security really um, rises to the top um, oftentimes as a primary, if not the primary, um, need and priority that survivors identify. So um, as a result, economic justice has been pretty central to the work that we have done over the course of the past decade. And we're going to talk more about what that has looked like. So this first slide, um, gives you a sense of CSAJ's mission and vision. So um, CSAJ envisions a world where all people have equal access to physical safety, economic security, and human dignity. And that um, bold vision um, is, is reflected in our mission statement as well. Um, CSAJ promotes advocacy approaches that remove systemic barriers enhance organizational responses, and improve professional practices to meet the self-defined needs of domestic and sexual violence survivors. So something you'll notice in this mission statement is that 
CSAJ's work really um, takes place on three different levels of impact, as we like to call it. So um, it, what we talk about in terms of the way that we approach the work and um, work with others in doing this work is to think about how our, um, you know, what the connections are between individual advocacy, um, community and organizational advocacy, and systems change and policy work, since we know that all three levels of impact um, need to inform one another to both help navigate and to help transform the way that um, survivors are able to access the resources that they need. Uh, okay, so actually before I do that, I'm going to just go back for one second. I want to um, just focus a moment of attention on the um, logo that you see here, which is CSAJ's logo. And um, it really does represent the mission and the vision statement um, and an approach to engaging in this work, which is intersectional in nature. It, um, CSAJ's logo represents intersecting identities. You'll see here class and gender and race and physical ability, religion, and other aspects of identity as shaping individual survivors' experiences, um, both with the abuse itself and with the systems that a survivor needs to navigate to access physical safety. Therefore, our advocacy for survivors needs to respond to the intersectional experiences that survivors face, both in terms of identifying needs and risks, and in terms of addressing the structural barriers that are faced by survivors who are um, marginalized in, in multiple ways. So this attention to structural barriers and inequality is a critical piece of our work. Okay, so um, as for the work of today, uh, you'll see here that we'll be covering three different areas um, over the course of this hour. One is to talk with you about CSAJ's framework. Um, we'll talk about how we, um, how, how the, the social science, the data, what we know from our work with advocates and lawyers and programs across the country um, informs our own thinking around how to access economic agency for survivors. And of course, we all want to hear about what you're seeing in your work. We'll describe work from the past and how that leads to the current work that we're doing today. And of course, we'll want to hear about what you are doing as it relates to our work. Um, and we'll share the focus of our newest phase of our Consumer Rights for Domestic and Sexual Violence Survivors Initiative, which will really be the focus of our um, conversation this afternoon. And if I can just chime in really quick, Erica, and acknowledge Absolutely. that in those questions that we'll be asking, um, I'm seeing a ton of um, folks from very different places and spaces introducing themselves. And so I'm really excited to hear what um, you all are seeing, doing, and, and what would be helpful. We've got folks from Pennsylvania, New York, Arkansas, Tennessee, uh, my home states of Oregon and Minnesota, um, Kansas. I'm just scrolling up and seeing um, where everybody is from. And so just on that place, um, factor alone. I know that we have a lot of really rich insights and experiences. So please, please keep the, the hellos coming and the questions and the ideas and um, all of that coming as, as we kind of talk through this webinar, which is a, a unique webinar as we're kind of laying the landscape of work to come rather than diving too deep into any one particular area. So really, really excited to have you all in conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm also looking at the list of folks um, signing in, and it's exciting to have so many different um, perspectives, also in terms of kind of the, the types of work that people are doing. So we have legal services folks joining us today um, who have mm -hmm. different focus areas, as well as um, 
people who are in the academic and law school environment, as well as community-based organizations. And um, yeah, it's really nice to see so many familiar names with such diverse expertise. So thank you all. Okay, so we are going to give you what we think of as the framework. Um, and we present this not because this will be um, really new information to folks um, or surprising in any kind of way, but really because um, when we gather the data, um, and I say that in sort of an informal way, some of it is data um, in a more formal way, but some of it is just information and narratives and um, and what we as a movement have come to learn. Um, when we take a look at this, it gives us some really um, core grounding principles that help us to assess and sort of reimagine how we can better engage in this important work to meet the needs of survivors. So, um, so that is the context in which we're, we're offering up this framework. And of course, would love to hear your reflections along the way, your additions, um, all sorts of um, sort of ruminations that you may have as we're delving into this. So feel free to jump in um, with your chatting as, as I go. So this is the first piece of, of our framework, and it really focuses on what we talk about as the reciprocal relationship between abuse and economic hardship. So that being that um, domestic and sexual violence lead to economic hardship, and economic hardship in turn leads to increased vulnerability to future violence. And it's really that reciprocal relationship between those two forces that makes domestic and sexual violence advocacy so um, challenging. Um, and we know that the, um, that, that relationship, of course, uh, is critical because really what it pans out to in many ways is the uh, reduction of options for domestic and sexual violence survivors, that we, when we have less access to economic resources, we have less access to options, um, and that is what really leads to increased um, vulnerability to, to violence. Um, you'll see here also in this um, visual that some comparison points. So, um, more than 70% of women who are receiving public benefits have reported abuse by a former partner at some point in their lives. More than half of homeless women report having been physically assaulted by an intimate partner. And this is in comparison to 25% of all women who report experiencing domestic violence. So we know that this link between poverty and economic hardship um, is quite real. Um, and we also know that women who are living in poverty experience violence at twice, twice the rate of those who do not. Um, so there are many economic costs, of course, that accrue as a result of all different types of violence that women experience. But um, Right here, this slide specifically focuses on economic abuse. And of course, this definition comes from the research of Adrienne Adams and her colleagues. Um, this was an article that came out in 2008. And we're just sharing the definition of economic abuse that, um, that Adrienne and her colleagues had articulated in that article, which is that economic abuse involves behaviors that control a woman's ability to acquire use and maintain economic resources, thus threatening her economic security and potential for self-sufficiency. So in, um, in this particular study, Adams and her colleagues developed a scale of economic abuse, and the researchers conducted a whole bunch of um, interviews with approximately 103 women who were receiving residential and non-residential services. Um, from uh, domestic violence service agencies in Michigan. 
And this is, and in this particular study, um, what they, one of the things that they found was that the um, percentage of women who had experienced economic abuse at some point during the course of their relationship was 99%. And this percentage was even higher um, than those who reported having experienced physical abuse. So, um, you know, that particular phenomenon of economic abuse clearly requires um, attention. The researchers also talked about economic abuse as falling into two different categories. On the one hand, economic control, and on the other hand, economic exploitation. So I'm sure that many of us on this call could identify um, different examples of economic control, and if um, folks wanted to talk about their own experience um, working with survivors or share examples of that, um, you know, we would welcome that to the conversation. So economic control, they talked about in terms of limiting access or preventing use of economic resources, and economic exploitation being more about sabotaging, sabotaging intentionally depleting resources to limit a survivor's options. And we know that the economic impact of domestic violence um, is substantial. And this particular slide highlights a number of um, negative economic outcomes, but of course there are many more. Uh, here it shows um, domestic violence leading to income and job loss, housing instability, uh, limited transportation options, as well as de decreased access to child care. And of course, um, as I alluded to earlier, all of these negative economic impacts have a negative um, impact on survivors' access to safety options, which in turn leads to increased risk of future violence. I want to turn to this particular um, graphic here um, because I think that it adds a, a different um, facet to the conversation when we talk about the economic impacts of, of domestic and sexual violence. So this is based on some field research that was carried out by um, CSAJ's previous director of research, Sarah Schoner, um, where she coined the term the economic ripple effect. So lots of times when we're talking about intimate partner violence, and this is actually true of physical violence as well, we often tend to focus on incidents, particular individual incidents of economic harm. But what we know um, is that the economic impact of domestic violence is profound and it compounds over the life course. So that it's not just a particular damage to property um, that is, is the substantial economic harm or a particular incidence of theft or identity theft or um, even uh, miss work day, but rather it's the cumulative impact over the life course that has such profound um, harms for domestic and sexual violence survivors. So we've created this graphic to demonstrate what we call the economic ripple effect. Um, the negative effects ripple from during the relationship, right? So that might include job loss or credit damage or theft or missed work to leaving the relationship, which could include relocation costs or, for example, legal fees, to the short-term experiences after leaving an abusive relationship, which could include housing instability or the cost of childcare, the cost of independent living more generally. And then, of course, the, the costs over one's lifetime trajectory, so um, mental health effects and the costs associated with that, um, certainly slowed professional or educational development, and of course all of this decreases one's options and again exposes survivors to increased risk of violence in the longer term. And um, you, I don't have um, the particulars mapped out right here, but I just do want to share that, you know, more recently researchers have begun to explore the long-term economic impacts 
focusing on areas like education and job insecurity, as well as the cost of seeking legal protection. And um, you know, one of the things that I want to point out is that in one particular study that was um, focused on legal protection, um, Hughes and Brush found that there was a cost associated with seeking civil protection orders that ranged anywhere from approximately 300 to approximately $1,000 um, just in seeking the legal protection and that that cost was not recouped over the long term. So you know, we often encourage and certainly help to pursue survivors to seek legal remedies, but I think we also have to acknowledge that just the um, act of engaging in seeking legal um, remedies involves the cost that's associated with it as well. Would love to hear from all of you if anything in that ripple effect resonates. And just to quickly call out that um, when you all registered for this webinar, you shared a, a really broad uh, wealth and knowledge that kind of fell into these different uh, categories. So just to um, point out some, some of that that you shared with us, um, additional examples of the ripple of, of harm during the relationship. Someone mentioned um, the fact that um, abusive partners drain bank accounts, run up credit cards, um, wages um, will start to be garnished. Um, even while they're still married, they start going through um, collections process, um, having to declare bankruptcy. Then in the leaving, um, different folks mention things like, as Erica just talked about, losing their job. And one of our attendees also just mentioned um, how employment sabotage sometimes will lead to losing that job. Um, then figuring out how to navigate um, low-wage work, not having a safety net, um, as well as um, dealing with the consequences of damaged credit, um, having costs and debts related to hospital bills, um, missed work, going to multiple court days. So that kind of runs the gamut from leaving the relationship into the short term. Someone acknowledged that frustration with the process and the lack of follow-up by service agencies is a really big um, barrier and adds cost. And that relates to what Erica mentioned with the Hughes and Brush Protection Order um, study, um, all the way to the lifetime where um, you all see and work with survivors on kind of chronic housing instability, um, dealing with student loans, and the impacts of poor and, and damaged credit or having no credit history. Um, and um, on top of that, looking at the way that this, there's um, looking at systemic inequality, the lack of um, not being able to get work authorization, not having rights or not knowing about legal rights, all of those things. So these are all things that you shared. And I wanted to kind of point out that um, kind of demonstrate the, the breadth and depth of, of this, this ripple effect. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing those ahead of time and, for, and Sarah for lifting those up right now. Um, that makes um, things um, helpful to kind of think about how these um, multiple, and as one person just mentioned, sort of circular at times, <laughs> um, impacts of um, economic harm. Um, create challenges and sort of helps us to think about what our strategies need to be in, in terms of addressing them. Um, so yeah, I see folks still typing. And, and feel free to continue the conversation as we march forward here. So the next sl slide um, talks about intimate partner violence um, and shows that the primary predictor of um, IPV across race is income and employment and access to education. Um, it's the greatest pr predictor of um, whether somebody will be experiencing um, domestic violence. 
Another piece of our framework in thinking about this, and some of this just came out as Sarah was sort of recapping some of the ripple effects and the um, structural barriers that play into those impacts. Um, another piece of this is the um, fact that there are substantial structural barriers that survivors face um, in their attempts to access physical and, and economic security. So um, this particular graphic actually comes from a uh, newly released, well, not as newly, but relatively speaking, newly released um, resource that CSAJ developed, which is our Atlas um, Accounting for Economic Security. We'll be talking about that project briefly a little bit later. But um, in, in that, you'll see this graphic. And we talk about the structural barriers in three types. Um, the first being resource availability, the second service response, and the last, um, the impact of policy. So I just want to highlight this here. When we talk about limited resource availability, um, the choice to seek legal protection for a survivor is often in direct conflict with a survivor's economic security. So for example, a low-income survivor has to contend with things like hours of operation, um, days off, whether or not they'll be able to take them, um, access to child care, as well as, of course, access to transportation. And we know that abusers often exploit these systemic barriers based on their knowledge of survivors' limited access to resources. So abusers engage in protracted litigation, knowing that the process will tire the survivor and that the resources required to engage in the legal process itself will deplete the survivor of economic resources. Um, when we talk about um, service response, you'll see right here that survivors' experiences with institutional actors and their experiences with rules and processes of programs matter a whole lot in their options for safety and economic security. So um, some of them are, are listed here, experience with um, few or dispersed or short-staffed services, um, sometimes lack of staff um, information or awareness. And um, just an example of this is the perceptions and biases of um, court actors that are essentially the gatekeepers to justice for survivors. So in courts, we see many times that there are preferences for preserving a two-parent family, um, which leads judges to award custody to abusive parents despite the very clear dangers that they pose to um, children and to their former partners. We also see punitive outcomes by judges in all sorts of different judicial contexts um, who are uninformed about the nature of domestic violence. And across different systems, survivors have to contend with um, overburdened or untrained or insensitive folks, sometimes even hostile institutional actors. Um, many people have talked about this, particularly in the public benefits context where TANF workers uh, have shown such negative attitudes towards survivors that it presented a pretty major barrier in terms of survivors being able to access um, the public benefits to which they were legally um, entitled. So the attitudes and perceptions of people within institutions, whether they're judges or public benefit workers or even folks within um, domestic violence service agencies, um, have a real critical um, impact on, on survivors' access to economic security. And then I just want to quickly talk about unequal policies here. So um, CSAJ has engaged in um, policy work on a number of different fronts and supported the efforts of folks in different states and communities. But you know, one example would be around the impacts of um, credit reporting and credit checks um, as a barrier to employment for survivors which of course compounds survivors' economic insecurity and pushes them into deeper poverty and leaves them with fewer safety options. Um, there are many, many other examples that we could share with you, but um, I'm gonna 
hop on to the next slide. So we've got a question for you now, um, which is um, if you're able to share with us um, what are the economic or consumer issues that are showing up for survivors with whom you work? Um, if you'd be willing to share some of those issues with you, with us rather, um, that would be helpful and give us some sense of, of where folks are, what they're seeing, and how that impacts the kind of work that you all are doing. been hearing a lot about the lack of child care and lack of housing or having um, having both of those but it being um, insufficient and they're being waiting lists and, and hard to access anyway mm -hmm. housing is coming up a lot language barriers making it difficult for survivors to pursue certain jobs Mm -hmm. Lack of transportation, rent, yeah. Yeah, that courts are reluctant to grant financial relief, making it um, or enforce monitor judgments. Mm -hmm. Credit is one that has shown up several times, um, as well as, you know, utilities, evictions, student debt, access to educational, um, educational access. Mm, somebody's highlighting a, a court-related barrier, um, which is courts refusing to accept poverty affidavits, which creates a huge um, access to justice issue. Mm. Finding jobs, yeah, student loans again. Mm -hmm. Court fees. Some of these are, yeah, good examples of system barriers that we were just talking about, which I think we often lose track of, right? When we're talking about economic advocacy, we're thinking about it in the context of um, sort of skill building. What are the economic, sometimes financial literacy skills? Um, when we know that the um, economic challenges that survivors face are so profound and require so much more than simply um, sort of financial literacy or skills development, but really um, some powerful tools to address those economic impacts for the individual, as well as changing of the systems themselves. We will be talking more about that. Thank you all for your contributions mm -hmm. here. Yeah, that's great. There's a final um, one no a connection to the law and policy about um, survivors in some cases not being able to relocate or not being able to relocate where they need to be or need to be safely um, because of, of local or, or maybe in some cases state laws. So kind of getting stuck um, in mm -hmm. these issues. So it all connects. Yeah, that would be a very um, sort of clear example of the legal framework as um, being structured in a fundamentally, um, a, a way that is fundamentally in conflict with survivors' safety and economic needs, um, the, the sort of custody, the way that custody laws are, are created. And while there have been many um, attempts to um, better center the um, needs of domestic violence survivors in custody proceedings. We know that um, many of the sort of cultural norms of family courts sometimes take precedence over the physical and economic needs of domestic violence survivors, particularly those who are most marginalized. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for these really rich examples. Um, we will no doubt continue to learn as we keep talking and even after today's program. So now that with that as context, and again, um, I encourage you all to take a peek at our atlas on, on economic security and many of the other resources that we'll share with you. Um, 
But with that as sort of the framework, we're going to dive into CSAJ's work and, um, and talk more concretely about um, ways that we might be able to work with you all in, in the coming months. So these are three of um, CSAJ's um, main projects. One is our Consumer Rights for Domestic and Sexual Violence Survivors Initiative. And we'll be talking about that in greater detail. Another project that was launched in 2015 is our Racial and Economic Equity for Survivors of Domestic and Sexual Violence Project, otherwise known as REAP. And then the third project um, relates to the ATLAS that I was just talking about. It's our Accounting for Economic Security ATLAS for Direct Service Providers. And each of these um, brings a slightly different, but certainly very much interconnected um, perspective to, to the conversation that we're having today. Um, I just want to talk about um, the initiative generally. Before we do that, um, sort of what, the why of consumer law, which I, I think that you all actually just um, brought to the the forefront of our minds, but um, you know, some of the ma the mainstream efforts around economic security for survivors have tended to focus on identifying ways to maximize income um, through programs such as job and financial literacy training. But less effort has been dedicated to remedying survivors' accrued economic damage, um, minimizing their expenses, and protecting their current assets. And it really is consumer law that offers a tool um, for doing that in very concrete ways, whether it's through um, issues like debt collection or credit discrimination, bankruptcy, tax advocacy, foreclosure, um, removing uh, criminal record barriers to employment and housing access, and we could go on. So in this respect, civil attorneys and advocates are very well situated to address the substantial economic harms that survivors face. And um, that really is sort of the impetus for our Consumer Rights for Domestic and Sexual Violence Survivors Initiative. Um, it's a national project that enhances economic justice for survivors by, on the one hand, building the capacity, and on the other hand, forging partnerships between domestic violence and anti-poverty lawyers and advocates across the country. The initiative began in 2007 with funding through the Office on Victims of Crime and has continued um, since then. And we just um, got another award through the Office on Violence Against Women for the next phase of this work. And so we're thrilled to be sharing um, that work with you all today and hope, hopefully engaging you in how we can make that work most meaningful. Um, just quickly, I want to mention this. We did a needs assessment in 2012 around the economic advocacy needs of survivors. And in, particularly, in particular, we um, surveyed over 220 lawyers and advocates across the country around the capacity to meet the consumer and economic needs of survivors. And we learned a number of different things, which you'll see here, one being that um, Oftentimes, advocacy was not really particular to um, addressing the role of economic coercion. Um, there wasn't a ton of screening going on related to economic issues that required more technical expertise, such as foreclosure or tax advocacy. And thirdly, um, there was a lack of institutionalized policies, protocols, and practices to encourage inter- and intra-agency collaboration. And um, it's the third one of those that really led to some of the, I think, um, exciting and innovating uh, demonstration site work that um, we were involved in and we'll talk briefly about later. But right now I'm going to hand it over to Sarah to delve into talking more about our guidebook. Great. Thank you, Erica. And all of that makes me think and want to ask all of you who are joining us today, kind of what, ha since you're sharing such rich information about what you're seeing 
um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what you're doing, it would be really helpful as we think about our work going forward to hear from you all some of the key things that you that you have learned over the years, over the course of your work that has that have been really critical in changing the way um, you do your work um, and the way your organizations are set up um, and how you approach different issues. So um, if any of um, your own gems come to mind, um, that would be really helpful to hear. Um, so from all of that and from the um, foundations that Erica laid out, um, the last phase of our consumer work really um, tried to meet the need that we were hearing from folks like yourselves who are on this webinar, um, a, a need for concrete resources. Um, tell us about some of these issues and share the strategies with us. We need resources on paper. We need to talk about it. We need training. Um, um, give us more, essentially, was what you were all calling for. So over the course of the last couple of years, we gathered some on-the-ground advocates, attorneys, um, folks that are doing this work to develop um, what you see here, which is the guidebook on consumer and economic civil legal advocacy for survivors. Um, it has numerous chapters, including an introductory chapter that kind of frames everything and provides some issue spotting and assessment um, tips and strategies. So if this is something you have not yet um, seen or accessed, I really encourage you to go to our website, um, csaj.org slash guidebook, um, and download it, thumb through it, um, contact us, let us know um, what would be helpful. Um, and this is really an important tool and resource that we're carrying forward in the current phase of work. So we'll kind of move into that to get your reactions to what's coming coming up. In addition to that, um, which is also critical to informing what we're about to do, is we've worked with some programs um, across the country that were, um, again, like yourselves, in very different contexts. And we worked with and learned from them about how to build partnerships how to understand, um, better understand the economic and consumer needs, um, mapping out in some cases what the economic ripple effect for survivors looked like in their community um, and how their work was addressing that and how they could enhance um, their work to address that. Um, so in 2014, after our first phase, um, we published this report that really talks about the kind of the how-to or some of those gems in building partnerships to enhance capacity for addressing um, the consumer and economic issues facing survivors. And coming up, um, uh, we also worked with the same sites and kind of really digging into, well, what do those partnerships mean? And how are survivors' needs changing over time? Um, and how are we attentive to that? And how do we link both um, survivor-centered individual advocacy with transforming the landscape that's prevalent here in our communities that, um, as you all were saying, for example, creating um, that there's just no available or there's no access to housing? What might we do on a community level to change that a little bit? So that report in assessing um, communities and organizations is, is coming up and based on that work. So these two um, products um, and tools and resources have really informed um, what we are um, about to do. But we would like to hear, in addition to what you've learned, ask you, um, how are you or others in your community already addressing the consumer rights um, or economic justice um, for survivors? What is it that you are doing um, that you're excited about? There was some conversation that folks were talking about a little bit earlier um, in terms of um, advocacy to ensure that uh, survivors have access to their birth certificates, 
social security numbers, and other forms of identification. Um, mm. I assume as a, um, you know, trying to ensure that they have better access to all different types of resources. Um, somebody else is talking about offering rent smart classes for free, working mm -hmm. with local community colleges to get scholarships for survivors, um, mm -hmm. financial empowerment classes, IBA um, projects, individual development account projects, um, classes offered in partnership with local banks. Mm -hmm. Um, folks institutionalizing economic justice by creating a dedicated space to having somebody as an economic empowerment advocate, mm -hmm. uh, partnering with legal aid. This must be a community-based organization that's partnering with legal aid in their community. It, this particular uh, participant is talking about um, representing survivors in all different types of legal, economic legal issues such as employment, housing, crime victims' compensation, bankruptcy, um, and work with creditors. Mm -hmm. so there's lots of rich work that is going on. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And from um, the registration as well, just to call it a few, folks are doing, um, in addition to that, things ranging from paying parking tickets and restoring licenses, that's similar to another attendee, um, doing advocacy either to prevent or delay eviction, um, a lot of landlord advocacy, um, even doing some expungement to um, kind of clean up criminal records um, in similar ways that folks are doing credit repair reporting work. Um, so lots of really good stuff. And there are ways that the, the education classes connect to who and how we do advocacy to um, who are some of those, those gatekeepers that Erica talked about later that our organizations and our partners um, can advocate um, with to kind of change the way some of these things um, roll out. So Hopefully, as you're all talking about this and what you're doing, I, I imagine you're also curious about what, what we're doing, what's next, what's, what's going on. Um, so in the last kind of 12 minutes that we have together, I want to talk about the new phase of the Consumer Rights Initiative and in particular highlight um, and talk about three of our big activities that we really hope um, you will all um, keep an ear to the ground on and engage with us in because we um, really need, um, really look forward to continuing conversation and learning with and connecting you all and, um, and carrying this work forward. So our goal with this phase of work is to continue enhancing consumer and economic civil legal advocacy for survivors. You can see here that we have three goals that, surprise, surprise, match um, what Erica talked about earlier in terms of our three levels of in, impact. Um, and this is all from, from things that we've learned from you all. So really continuing to enhance individual consumer advocacy and um, build the capacity of the field um, on key issues as well as in terms of a partnership building. Um, second, to strengthen organizational and community change. Uh, again, that's primarily through who are potential partners, who are surprising allies, um, and how can, can we work together to identify and change um, what our organizations and institutions and communities look like. Um, and then leveraging all of that to engage in system change work. What does that, again, what does that mean? What does it look like? Um, and I imagine all of you um, joining us today have some pretty clear pictures of how you've engaged in those different levels and encourage you to start sharing some of that with us now as we go through it. Uh, so one important piece of this work before we get into some of the key activities is that um, CSAJ is, is privileged to work with a cadre of what we call expert advisors and we've convened the consumer rights working group of folks who are really working on the ground um, in various consumer and economic issues. And I know some of these partners are with us um, today, so I would encourage you to 
say hello again and introduce yourselves. We're working with the Center for Court Innovation, uh, Futures Without Violence, uh, the National Consumer Law Center, Prosperity Now, um, which used to be known as CFED, um, and they're a financial um, and economic security national organization working with low-income people, as well as um, the Indiana Legal Services, um, particularly with their low-income taxpayer clinic, Legal Aid of Western Michigan, really looking at housing foreclosure and defense and bankruptcy issues, the Legal Aid Society um, that's based here in New York City. They do a lot with family law and um, linking up with economic and consumer law. Um, Katie Von Delinde is an expert advisor as well as a faculty in, at um, the School of Social Work in Washington University who's really a national trainer in um, survivor-centered economic advocacy. And then Adrian Adams, you'll um, recognized from earlier, who's a research partner, as well as Angela Litwin, who is a legal scholar at the University of Texas. So we're kind of, as you can see, linking um, um, different levels of, of work um, to really inform um, the work that we do and to link them with you all in technical assistance, in training, in better understanding needs and, and creating new um, strategies. Um, for change. So uh, we're really excited to have them on board. So one of the primary things that, that we have done since our inception and that we're thrilled to continue doing is really uh, focusing on technical assistance with and for you all. Um, as you see here, it's about supporting your projects and your advocacy. It's also about um, really focusing on building a culture of peer exchange, networking, and connecting. Um, so we encourage you, if any of the things that we've talked about today, any of the things that you've shared um, are things that you are thinking about and working on on a day-to-day -day basis, contact us um, and, and we'll, we'll help you. We'll connect you with either our expert advisors or other programs that we know about. Um, that is what we do. And, um, I don't know, Erica, if you want to share an example, if you have one on hand of, of what we've provided in the past to kind of get folks' mental, mental juices flowing. Um, I have some as well, but. Um, why don't you get, go ahead, Sarah, and share one. I'm, I'm happy to jump in, but um, if you have one handy, go for it. Great. Um, so just to give you all a sense of what it is that we do do, um, we have walked through, um, hopped on the phone with folks and really walked through what it is that they do, walk through their advocacy approach, offer suggestions to enhance the way that they assess um, survivors' needs, looked at, examined organizational protocols, um, identified um, new or perhaps different ways the organization can support survivor-centered economic advocacy, um, we have linked programs in peer exchange, both to share how they've approached a particular issue and also to talk more generally about um, how they approach the work. Um, one example there is a program in Maryland um, linked up with a program in Pennsylvania, and they actually ended up doing a site visit exchange and talking about their work and, and figuring out um, how issues are the same or different, how they might approach them. Um, in addition, we can help with strategic planning and needs assessments and really um, look at what you already know um, and help assess uh, insights and stories that you've already gathered to, uh, again, map out, let's say, that ripple effect where you are and, and, and target, um, target needed change within, within the capacity and the resources that you have. So those are a couple. Yeah, I think that that gives a, a nice sort of uh, view of the, the different ways that folks can engage us, right? Whether it's a concrete case example, um, right? It might be somebody who's struggling with predatory lending or credit-related um, challenges and needs around credit repair. Um, it could be somebody who um, is grappling with um, 
bankruptcy issues. So the issues are broad ranging in terms of um, consumer and economic civil legal issues. But um, yeah, I think that what Sarah was just um, raising is the fact that this may be around individual needs as well as helping organizations to rethink how they can um, engage in this work um, and partner with others as well as um, sort of do the types of strategic planning to transform their own organizations and their communities. So feel free to reach out to us on, on any and all of those levels. Um, we would love to be able to bring all of the rich resources of these partners to bear. Mm -hmm. And feel free to share now what would be helpful, because I'm sure that others um, might either have ideas um, or are, are thinking the same, and we can help facilitate connection amongst you all as well. Um, so another exciting activity and a way to kind of that and something that could really be used as a launch pad into further TA is because of the guidebook and the overwhelming response that we've gotten, um, a, a major activity that we're engaging in over the course of the next two, year, two years is something we're calling the training toolkits on consumer and economic civil legal advocacy for survivors. So what are they? Training, these training toolkits are a there'll be a series of interactive webinars on key economic or consumer issues, and they're really meant to help um, implement the guidebook as well as expand access to it. So as you can see here, we're going to start with an introduction webinar um, in April. Stay tuned for, for details on that that will more fully lay out the landscape of the guidebook, including issue spotting and introducing a general process for how to link individual um, to systems advocacy. Um, then we're going to host a series of five training toolkits. And each toolkit is meant to support individual advocacy as well as organizational partnerships. So you can see here that five topics will be covered. And each topic will get two webinars. <laughs> that sounds like um, an algebra problem, but I promise um, it'll be fun and engaging and exciting. Um, so what's going to happen, for example, um, we're hoping in about June or July we'll have our first toolkit, um, we think, on debt and credit. Um, the first webinar, part one, will really look through what is it, what are legal strategies, um, how can we engage um, and start to examine innovative partnership models. Then a couple weeks later, we'll have part two webinar. And this will really go into modeling um, what partnerships are, maybe doing some mapping to I help identify who potential partners might be, um, what um, systems uh, change areas are right for advocacy, and really working together in more of a workshoppy kind of way um, uh, how to address coerced debt, for example. Um, and so we'll have these toolkits. Um, over the course of the next couple years as a way to continue to provide foundational knowledge and really engage with you um, in crafting um, strategies and building partnerships and perhaps even bringing in some of your partners or colleagues to these webinars to really work through an issue together in these toolkits. That's one exciting opportunity, kind of building on our pilot and demonstration site work. Um, we're thrilled to put the spotlight on innovative consumer justice initiatives. That's probably a lot of you all. Uh, the purpose of these are really to serve as a peer exchange opportunity, where we want to hear from you um, your best practices on in consumer and economic advocacy and share that with the field. So we're looking to spotlight, um, we'll be able to spotlight between 10 and 12 programs or initiatives over the course of the next two years. And we're hoping to lift up a diverse representation of, of different efforts. So whether you're located in a rural or urban area, if you're in a tribal community or US territory, or what level of work you're working at, um, a coalition, a legal services agency, a grassroots 
community-based organization, um, an organization working with culturally specific or underserved communities. Uh, we want to hear from you and help share your work back to the field to really develop what's taking place, what the range of practices that are going on. Um, and then all of these will be featured as short little videos so people can engage with you and ask questions um, and really start to understand um, how it is that you're approaching the work. Um, so you'll see here a link um, to a form where we can kind of start the, the process and hear from you. So if this sounds exciting to you, uh, click this link that I'm going to share right now um, and let us know who you are and, and what you're working on. And um, we'd love to um, follow up with you and, and see, um, see how we can kind of share, share this work and really expand um, our learning about what's effective in terms of partnerships, in terms of advocacy, in terms of systems advocacy. Um, a little typo here. Um, we're accepting um, submissions to the forum through March 31st, not March 3rd. That's like tomorrow. Um, so <laughs> through the end of March, take a look. And we'll also send this out um, in follow-up, so don't worry about um, doing it by tomorrow. But we're really excited to hear from you all and to, and to really amplify the work that's being done across the country so that we can all better understand how to engage and how to learn from one another in the work. So those are the main activities I just want to highlight really quickly because some of you on the call um, might um, attend this conference that the National Consumer Law Center holds. We will also be there at their annual litigation conference in October. Um, and this kind of goes back to the work of building partnerships between consumer and domestic violence or, or family um, lawyers and, and looking at how to, how to meet the, the, the overlapping needs of, of survivors. Um, and we'll share outcomes of this work as well as um, help promote this conference with you all. So if that's something that you already do or would like to do, um, let us know and feel free to reach out about that. I know we're a little over, so I want to kind of move to the end here. And we're kind of wrapped up. Um, I want to just, as I highlight some things that are coming up in the next couple of months, um, I do want you to think about um, and let us know before you hop off. Given all of that you've heard today, given the activities that we're going to be engaging you in, what would be most helpful? What sounds exciting? What do you need? Whether that's training, um, particular resources, networking opportunities, um, what is it that would be most helpful to you? And while folks um, think about that, I, I just want to um, uh, emphasize, because I know we threw a lot of different resources at you today. So there's a link to the guidebook that um, exists and that we shared, and for which folks need to fill out the form online in order to get access to a password. And then there was the spotlight. Um, that Sarah was just talking about, where we would love to be able to hear about your um, work and learn from what you're doing. Um, so there's a separate link that we just shared um, to be able to get that information. Just want to clarify that. So it looks like folks are looking Thanks. for resources for, for networking, um, screening, so um, mm -hmm. you'll be happy to know that there are some screening tools that exist in the guidebook on consumer and economic civil legal advocacy that you can access, as well as a previous screening tool on our website. So yeah, check out the website for sure and take a close look at the guidebook. But there will be more mm -hmm. resources to come. Mm -hmm. And we'll make sure that in our follow-up emails to this webinar that we include the resources that we reference so that um, that we kind of lay it out there for you in an easy in an easy way. Um, Somebody asked about webinars. Yeah. Mm. Webinars. So we'll yeah. 
we'll be sending out a schedule of webinars of topics and so that actually um, highlights the fact that if you are not already on our um, listserv or mailing an uh, email mailing list um, please um, and you're interested in being on it then um, please make sure to hop on our um, website and, and request that um, so that we can be sure that all of this information gets to you. Mm -hmm. We should have a full webinar calendar for this year, for 2018, um, very shortly. And I'll just plug that in April, we will have that initial issue spotting slash framing webinar. And then in June, we'll have our first toolkit or two webinars um, on debt and credit advocacy and partnership building. Um, and interspersed through all of that is where we'll release um, these video spotlights. And those will be additional ways for you to engage and um, learn from one another. I love all the stuff that's coming in about um, job training, um, accessing resources and benefits. And that makes me think of kind of a sit down to, um, again, really problem solve some of these issues together, which is what our training toolkits will really um, be focused on, on doing is engaging you all in some of these critical issues. Yeah, um, and I want to encourage folks to, again, reach out to us because um, there are lots of interesting ideas that people are sharing and um, it would be great to have some more context so that we can be helpful. Um, we, yeah, we would love to learn more about what you're interested in and think with you um, in the context of your community and your state. So please um, mm -hmm. do reach out. Yeah. So that leaves me with the ways that you can do that. Don't forget to take a look at this Google form when we send the link to you later um, and kind of um, and pitch your idea and work with us as a spotlight. Um, you can also email us at our, um, I'll type it in right now, but we'll, we'll share it with you after. Um, with our informational account, and we are um, we are very responsive to that. So don't be shy. Feel free to reach out um, and let us know what's up and what would be helpful. So with that, if there are other questions, we're happy to take them. Otherwise, thank you so much for sharing what it is that you're seeing, what, what it is that you're doing, and letting us know um, what would be helpful so we can make sure that these activities that come up um, really are, are, are meeting, um, meeting you at the place, um, meeting you at the place where you, you have all those needs. So um, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. I want to echo thanks um, to all of you and um, to, to NCJ SPJ for hosting today. Um, and, yes. of course, to the Office on Violence Against Women for um, supporting this next phase of, of work. So we're very much looking forward to continuing to be in conversation with all of you. So hope to hear from you very soon. Yes, yes. Thank you.